Okay, we are going to get started. Um, everyone, welcome to today's master class with editor extraordinaire Amir Lewis. Thank you for making this time with us this morning, Amir. No problem. Um, so again, this is our GFS um, master class um, as part of the Film Credits Summer Initiative. initiative. Um, I'm Tamika Gashard, and I'll be um, moderating um, this morning's master class. Um, Amir is going to show us all of his tricks of the trade. Um, he's had a story career um, editing both narrative and nonfiction. Um, he's edited everything from um, things, um, pieces driven by spoken word, music, historical, PBS, um, Emmy nominations. Um, so again, just really, really excited um, for this conversation this morning. So you've been doing this over 20 years now, right, Amir? Yeah, easily. Easily over 20, probably over 30, actually. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah. This is, uh, we're going to do a more extensive Q&A after you kind of... Um, let us into your world, but I'm just curious to know before we get started, did you always know that you wanted to kind of master like post-production? Like what was kind of your entry point into no. <clears throat> So just quick uh, non-filmic bio. Uh, I am, you know, from the Lower East Side of Manhattan and from Brooklyn. Uh, so, you know, my, my father was a musician was a, a, a studio, uh, a bass player. Uh, if any of you know <clears throat> uh, uh, David Bowie uh, and, and Fame, the song Fame, that iconic bass line, that's my dad laying down the bass uh, on, on that song. So, but I, as, as you know, famous as that may sound, the life of a studio musician is not a, a fiscally responsible one. Uh, mm -hmm. So I very much grew up in a household that you know, sometimes we were balling out. Sometimes there was like, you know, no food in the fridge. So I never had any expectations of a real nine to five job that wasn't really modeled for me. I mean, my mom was a teacher, so I, I guess in some ways that was modeled. But um, so the artistic lifestyle was sort of laid out in front of me uh, in that regard. But I didn't really think I was going to pick that up. Um, I knew I really, really loved uh, Shakespeare. Uh, in high school, I, I loved literature in general. So when I went to college, I decided to become an English major, also not a very profitable uh, decision uh, to make. And then fast forward, long story short, never actually uh, finished school during the intended uh, time frame, uh, and came home and um, needed to get surgery on my arm, which is also a very long and, and twisted story. And unbeknownst to my parents, I had actually uh, unenrolled, AKA dropped out of school. Wow. So I was no longer on my parents' insurance, had to get enrolled somewhere. My mom uh, talked to the insurance company, quickly went into black mother mode, because they, they were like, we can't help you. He's not enrolled on your insurance. Talked to the sister, the woman was like, look, just get the boy enrolled somewhere. My two choices were the French Culinary Institute and the Center for Media Arts. I chose the Center for Media Arts and that sort of put me on this path towards filmmaking. Totally, totally random. If, if I had chosen, just fun fact, if I had chosen the Center, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the Culinary Arts School on Grand Street, which was very close to my neighborhood, I found out many, 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 many years later that um, Baby Bam, AKA Africa, and Mike G uh, from the Jungle Brothers were at that school at that time. So if I had gone to that school, I think I would have been in the Jungle Brothers and probably would have had a rap career, which would have made me much happier uh, right now. So, but well, you I know, did the other thing. I did the filmmaking thing. Before right. you did a few bars. That's, right. that's going right, to happen. Right, right, right. I mean, I would have just had a tambourine or something in the background. So I would have actually been a rapper, per se. I would have been a hanger. I would have been like, you know, Jerobi in A Drop Call Quest. You know? Oh, okay. Okay. I see you. I see you. So this is... <laughs> So this is everything because again a lot of folks don't realize like all of our paths are super windy in right. this in this industry you know and again like 
you know, we have, I think we have everyone here. We're, we're about around 10. So we'll do like okay. our formal introductions. Again, um, I love to nerd out on this stuff. I'm the curriculum and outreach strategist for GFS Film Credits. And, you know, again, Amir Lewis, I mentioned some of his accomplishments, you know, PBS Pioneers of 13, receiving honors from Sundance, um, Ken, Cameron Dorf at Slam. Um, he, at, he teaches at both NYU and Brooklyn College. And, you know, he gets, just gave us a little tidbit about how a, a lot of us, health insurance drives our life decisions, um, sure. literally. So, you know, bef without further ado, and we, we will circle back to those bars that you'll spit before the call ends. But, you know, we just want to make sure you have enough time to kind of jump into, you know, the master class and, you know, share your screen and let us in on a little bit of your magic. Will do. Thank you, uh, Tamika, and, and, and thanks to, to Sharice Bullock and Naheem and Casey and everybody over uh, at Ghetto Film School. Um, like Tamika was saying, I, I teach at NYU. Um, I've been there for about, I tend to think in terms of semesters and not years, but because my courses tend to be in the fall semester, so I'm not there for the full year. But anyway, I, I've been there through 10, uh, about 10 years, um, long enough to, for some of my students to actually be in the business. Uh, and I tell them all, uh, you know, I teach an intro class. I'm not trying to wreck anybody's GPA. Professor Lewis is gonna be extremely nice to you because the reality of this situation is I might actually wind up working for you someday. So as an editor, I'm not trying to crush anybody's dreams. And more importantly, I'm not trying to sit across from you at a desk, you know, five years from now and be like, I'm not hiring this dude, he gave me a D. So uh, I will extend that same credit and, and uh, sort of offer to oh, all the ghetto film school students. Uh, I will be extremely nice to you. Uh, during this master class, because I might also wind up working for one of y'all one day, hopefully uh, one day. Um, I, I believe in very strongly in the art of storytelling, um, not just in my editor room, but also in life in general. I'm one of those people, I, I'm sure many of you as filmmakers are as well, if I'm sitting on the train and it's stuck in the tunnel, I'm imagining that nuclear war is going to break out, somehow that this metal in this train car is going to protect us from the radiation and we are going to have to reorganize and repopulate the earth with just the people on this train and once i start thinking that i start creating backstory for everybody the woman sitting across from me what's her backstory are you what what skills does she sort of bring to the party is she also a paramedic What's the situation with this couple over here? What's going on? Are they going to be a couple? Are they going to give us babies to create? You know, am I going to become a warlord and have dominion over all these people? That's normally how the story winds up ending, is that I, I'm going to be the warlord of this train, and all these people are going to work for me, and I am personally going to repopulate the earth with all the people, you know, on this train. But I can totally see me. that. I can yeah. see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, but... Being a storyteller on that level, uh, which I think that many of us are, many of us who are drawn to the filmmaking profession are, it's about, your editing is really about your ability to take your personal stories and stories that you know and connect them to your characters. In a documentary, I'm constantly searching for points of connection between my life, my stories, and this person's stories. And once I find that point of connection, then I can tell their story because I'm really telling my story, right? So uh, I, I think we all do that. And with narratives, we do that as well, right? Even in the audience, like we are searching for that point uh, of connection between us and the characters on screen. And we often, people of color, don't see ourselves on screen, so we miss that point of connection. Or it's a little force. We have to jump up here, like with Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Like maybe we're down here, or we kind of feel some things that Buffy's talking about, but we got to jump a little because, you know, Buffy doesn't necessarily look like us. So being a good editor, being a good storyteller is about having to find those little ways of knitting these things together and to making sure that they connect for everybody, you know. And it's not always possible, but, you know, you try, you try your best. Um, uh, I told the, the crew at the Ghetto Film School, uh, I have this thing that I'm contractually at NYU bound to show my students, which is this horrible, horrible film on the history of editing called The Cutting Edge. I'm, because I'm not contractually bound, this is not NYU, 
I am not going to uh, do that to you, but I do have a shorter six minute version about the history of editing. I, I'm not sure. I see, I see all your names, you know, popping up here, but I'm not necessarily sure what your backgrounds are. So forgive me if, if all of this is sort of um, known to you, but I'll just show you this quick video. I am going to attempt to share my screen, which it looks like Casey has given me the ability to do. Um, I go to here and I'm going to click share. Hopefully you are all seeing now my YouTube. I will go to full screen. Um, Tamika, just give me a thumbs up if you see the, okay, all right, this is how to cut a film. Uh, so I'm going to play this. I also hope Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Um, Casey, you told me how to do this and I don't think I did it. Uh, let me just stop this share just for one second because I think uh, that I have to do something else, right? I have to share computer sound. Also, please forgive me if any of you have seen the verses uh, between Teddy Riley and Babyface. Uh, and there was that moment uh, where uh, baby, I mean, I'm sorry, Teddy Riley was exposed as an ignorant of technology old man where he was like looking into the screen, like how we get this to work? How I, I don't want to do that. So I'm trying to keep my stuff together. So I don't uh, Teddy Riley myself. Um, okay, but I shared the computer sound. I'm gonna do this, click share. I think we are good to go now. And here is the history of editing in six minutes. Ah, uh, the edit. The moon touge. Cornerstone of any nutritional film. Dee Dee Lewis's flawless performance, bull hockey. That's the best of 20 different takes. It's the thing you see and hear the most in a film and goes unnoticed. Seriously, we watch on average 20 cuts per minute on TV without even noticing. But it wasn't always that seamless. The first cut, well, it was brash and someone had to do it. Let's travel back through the history of editing, find out what a bunch of Soviet propagandists have to do with Rocky's training regimen, and see if we can't figure out why Kuleshov said the film is born in the edit. Welcome to film school. Continuity. The quality of something that does not change as time passes. That's life. As we know it, the distance between two places stays the same. Reality is constantly now, 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 now. And it's not a coincidence that this is how the first films looked back in the 1800s. Cameramen exposed their rules of film, pointing at one single thing. There were not cuts, nobody even considered it, and it looked just like life. Amazing, beautiful, oh good god, this is boring. But audiences back then were amazed by it. Then the first edit happened. It's called a stop trick, and all they did was stop the camera, tell everyone to freeze, and swap out the actress for a dummy. We still use this today in modern comedies. <laughs> oh, Rogan. People notice the stop trick, but they accept it for the sake of the story continuing. Then George Albert Smith makes scene through a telescope and moves the camera closer halfway through a scene and invents the close-up. Good God, look at the size of those yams! The characters are suddenly giant size and space continuity are broken, but people don't seem to really notice because their brains fill in the gap. Then James Williamson turns the camera around halfway through a scene and invents the angle. In real life, we can't see both the front and back of an object in the same instance, but we, the viewer, can glue the angles together in our heads. You see, continuity editing gets its name from the illusion of continuous. I can go around in circles all day, but this is just a seamless loop, wherein the room allows for establishing angle and a preceding angle to be in the same shot. Filmmakers are going to invent all kinds of conventions to make this smoother. The 180 degree rule, the establishing shot, cutting on action. This is all for quicker, more efficient storytelling. But any Charles Dickens novel has parallel storylines jumping between different characters in different places. And that's exactly what D.W. Griffiths set out to emulate. He cuts from a wife who misses her husband to her husband, hundreds of miles away, cast away on a beach. He shatters character continuity, spatial continuity, but the viewer buys it. We know she's thinking about him because one follows the other. And on the other side of the world, a group of revolutionary Soviet filmmakers who are trying to figure out how to convey abstract ideas with cinema see Griffith's movies and adore them. They all have big Griffith boners and decide to take his concepts further. A man named Lev Kuleshov runs an experiment about editing. He intercuts a shot of a man first with a bowl of soup, then a girl in a coffin, and finally a woman lounging on a sofa. He shows it to some audiences and they marvel at the remarkable performance. 
He's so hungry. Then he's so sad. Then he's so lustful. Personally, I've seen better, but the subtlety of his performance was so astounding to the audience who is unaware that the shot of the man is the same in each scene. Where is this emotion coming from? Not the same three shots of the man. And the gravitas of the bullet soup didn't really grab me. It's something intangible coming from the cut itself. There's information in the juxtaposition. They call this montage from the French word to a symbol. It's the theory that the meaning of two shots put together is greater than the sum of its parts. It's a mental geography that the viewer constructs. No matter how far apart, the human mind will naturally try to connect the dots. Show a gun and a body and we infer a murder. Show a few groups of people and we infer a large crowd. Show Catherine Denis taking a swig, then some cigarettes in bed and we infer... Take a look at the Rocky training video. We see him go on all of one run, bits and pieces of one workout session, and a grand total of 22 push-ups. You're gonna kill him! Hey. But we get the idea that training is hard and he improves. I'm going to use Wet Hot American Summer as an example because it's even more blatantly laid out for you. Gene, the man wearing a do-rag from Law & Order, tries to whip Coop into shape. Duh, these dance moves are so hard. He's not as quick as Gene. He's just not as fast as Gene. <laughs> I can't do it. Duh, boy. He's getting a little bit better. He's getting a little bit quicker. Has an emotional breakthrough about his complicated relationship with his father. Getting faster, quicker, frothy, frothy, frothy. Is he going to do it? He's going to do it. He's going to win. 20 seconds later, Coop's now more physically fit than when he started. Regardless of the example, most of the story isn't being told on screen. It's being told in the mind of the viewer. And see, that's what the Soviets were onto. And while Griffith used continuity aiding to evoke an emotional response from viewers, Eisenstein would often use intellectual montage. What that is, is associating opposing imagery to invoke an abstract idea. Here's a good example from Battleship Potemkin. The tapping of a cross and the tapping of a sword the church, and the czarist bloodshed that would follow. The creation of a tool and the technology it would lead to. And as far as continuity editing, it's a form of montage too. The dots are just closer together, and the mind supplies less of the connective information. From matched action, to flashbacks, to hallucinations, even a form of intellectual montage through visual linkage. Images that look and are associated together. I mean, dialogue is cheap, and Freud was right. And while you're watching a movie, connecting the dots, forming the story in your mind, some edits gave you the whole story from the very beginning. And you didn't even know it. Like a big, fat... All right. Um, I, I hope the, the audio is loud enough uh, for everybody to hear. Is, is, okay. All right. Perfect. Uh, let me, let's stop this share for a second. We'll go back to uh, just sort of looking at you guys. Um, yeah. Uh, so they, they covered a lot in, in there, and they did it in a very tight, well-edited, compact uh, sort of six minutes. But I think the, the big takeaways really and always are story, story, story. And it's how we tell these stories in the edit room to sort of enhance what the, well, let's go back for a second, right? Many of you are creating your own films and you're doing that as sort of a one man or one person operation, right? And so you're writing something, you're conceiving of it in your mind, putting it down on paper with a pen or, you know, with a, a, a keyboard uh, of some sort. Uh, and then you're directing it, you're executing it, you're gathering up a bunch of your friends and, and other fellow creatives and creating that story. And you'll see right away, huh, I intended this scene to take place at sunset. So it's raining right now. We can't do it at sunset. We're going to do it inside, but that's okay. We're going we're gonna to adapt, right? And most people are incredibly adaptable when they're in the production or the directorial phase they somehow seem to lose that adaptability once they get into the editing stage or into the post-production stage. But you can be just as adaptable in post-production as you are during production. You just have to sort of free your mind uh, to think about it that way. The story that you originally wound up writing 
the last draft of that script is really the first draft of your edit, right? Or the first rough cut, right? So you're taking something, you're writing it, you're shooting it, and then you're rewriting it in post-production. You're rewriting it in the edit room. Um, there is a way that, there is a way, when I'll show you my timeline later for the project that I'm working on, but there was actually a way to take your timeline and if you're using script sync mode in Avid, actually recreate a new script based off of your timeline. And it's a really powerful thing to see, uh, to sort of, you know, because you know, you're, you're taking your fingers and you're typing this thing out. And that kind of makes sense uh, in, in this new world of, you know, word processing, et cetera, et cetera. But when you see the machine take all of these little pieces of video and turn that into a script, it's really, really powerful. And it really reminds you, okay, this editing thing, it's really a different form of writing. That, uh, that's the easiest way to think about it. And if you can control a word processor, if you can use Microsoft Word, then I can teach you how to use Avid. It's really fundamentally the same thing. You know, the concept of bringing media in is the same as the concept of typing words that are in your brain and putting them down on page or on screen or in your document, right? So once, once we start to, because I, I know that uh, nonlinear editors like Avid or Final, well, nobody uses Final Cut Pro anymore, but Avid and Premiere and DaVinci Resolve, which I'm a big proponent of. I've used the pandemic uh, to teach myself DaVinci Resolve. Um, I was very happy uh, that, that I did that because I'm not normally the type of person that will willingly teach myself something new. Like, you know, if you're going to pay me to learn it, fine. But if not, uh, I'm going to stick with what I know. But I taught myself DaVinci Resolve and it is free, free, free. So I suggest everybody. Uh, whether you're on a PC or a Mac, go ahead and download uh, DaVinci Resolve because it's free, right? You know, whereas Avid is $1,500 and, you know, Adobe Premiere is, I won't even get started on the, the, the slimy uh, subscription model of Adobe Premiere where they sort of string you out and charge you 14 bucks a month uh, for the rest of your life because I just find that criminal. But anyway, um, so going back to this whole concept of looking what at what film school did for us they they talked about a bunch of you know what actually i am I, casey i don't know if you took away oh no, no i still have the ability to screen share i'm just going to go back to that video just for one second because there are a couple of things that i wanted to say when they were talking right so you know when they're oh well they're talking about the stop trick there so here they're talking about ah, E.W. Griffith, right? I, I just putting on like action. By, this is right? all for quicker, more efficient storytelling. But any Charles Dickens novel has parallel storylines jumping between different characters in different places, and that's exactly what D.W. Griffith set out to okay. emulate. So this guy, a absolutely the father of modern cinema, also absolutely a virulent racist. Right, like so, he created what is known. If you, for any of you who are in film school, you you all heard about, you know, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Ma Nation, and, and how legendarily it, it it sort of created all these things that that we think of as contemporary filmmaking. And he indeed do did do that. He didn't create those things. He did create the use of close up. He did create uh, the the use of sort of parallel storytelling inside the context of filmmaking, not inside the context of storytelling, because like they said, Charles Dickens was doing that, you know, many, many years before that. But it is impossible to look at his work. Really? He cuts, you know, oh, here, of course they chose, you know, Enoch Arden, you know, as opposed to Birth of a Nation, you know, because it's, you, you have this power to tell a story and how you tell that story or what story you tell is also equally as important as the technical chops that, uh, that you're using to tell that story. So yeah, he did indeed create all these things, but I can't allow it to go by. I can't, I can't uh, allow us to give him props without also talking about the, the incredible damage, you know, uh, that he did. I mean, you know, Birth of a Nation came out and, and I think there were uh, something like 160 lynchings in the sort of year to pass after that, after the film came out, after uh, it was sort of why, because it basically was a, you know, uh, a, a rally, uh, a yay for the Klan uh, type film, you know. So uh, that was one thing I wanted to point out. The other thing I wanted to point out was about uh, the Russian filmmakers. 
these guys. We're trying to figure out how to convey abstract ideas with cinema, see Griffith's movies, and adore them. They all have big Griffith boners and decide to take his oh, concepts further. A man named Lev Kuleshov runs an experiment about editing. He so I really think that a lot of filmmaking is reactionary, especially within the creative space, right? So they indeed, they, they I, I don't necessarily agree with the film schooled interpretation of this. The Russian filmmakers didn't necessarily, I think they respected what D.W. Griffith did, but they didn't necessarily agree with it because D.W. Griffith's approach to filmmaking was sort of one of, you know, creating the illusion of fantasy. And the Russian filmmakers really wanted to focus on the reality, pointing the camera. They, they were much more documentarians uh, in their approach. And, and you see that borne out with their sort of cinematic techniques here. Like he intercuts a shot of a man first with a bowl of soup, then a girl in a coffin, and finally a woman lounging on a sofa. He shows it to some audiences and they marvel at the remarkable performance. He's so hungry. Right, so here what Kuleshev is doing, he's not creating an alternate fantasy world, right? He's not doing what uh, Griffith did uh, in Celebration of the Clan or creating these, you know, modern day or, or sort of um, previous day uh, telenovelas, right? What Kuleshev is doing is I'm going to shoot 30 seconds of a bowl of soup, 30 seconds of a girl playing, and 30 seconds of somebody crying over a casket. And then he's aware what the real thing that he really wants to do oh, is see the audience reaction to that. So he's factoring in the audience to that. So this notion of sort of reactionary filmmaking, right? So look at the filmmakers that you like, pick out the things that you would like to emulate and then also pick out the uh, things that you, you don't necessarily agree with, right? Uh, uh, because as creatives, we're constantly balancing ourselves with like, huh, I see what they're doing. I really appreciate that. I want, I want to do something just like that. Or you know, uh, I'm sure we've all watched films where we're like, you're watching it and you're like, that's some bullshit, right? I could do better than that. And that sort of spurs us to then become uh, better filmmakers. So just know that you're not alone in that because the Russians were doing that when they watched uh, D.W. Griffith's films. Um, last thing I wanted to, to point out in this that I really, really agree with is, I think right here. Rocks. No matter how far apart the human mind Sorry, go back. The mental geography that the viewer constructs, no matter how far apart Not going back far. information in the juxtaposition, they call this montage from the French word to a symbol. It's the theory that the meaning of two shots put together is greater than the sum of its parts. It's a mental geography that the viewer constructs. No matter how far apart, the human mind will naturally try to connect the dots. Show a gun and a body and we infer a murder. Show a right, so show a gun, show a body, hear a gunshot. Even if we don't see the moment of murder, even if we don't see the bullet enter the body, the human brain will say, I saw a gun. I saw somebody cowering in fear in the corner. I heard a gunshot, somebody died, right? And we, it, we did that, or the audience did that, right? So you always have to factor in. I, I find that me as an editor, any of us as storytellers, you always have to factor in your audience and what they're bringing to the party, right? In some ways, filmmaking uh, or editing is really like, and not necessarily BYOB because we're not necessarily bringing your, you know, your own beer to the party, but, but it's almost like BYOE or bring your own experience to the scene or to, to, to the party, right? So now, now you're, you're thinking like, well, everybody has a different experience, so how can I necessarily control that? And as cre creatives, we all like to be in control. Let that go. Let that go. Like the most powerful films have an effect on person A who has this experience with, you know, uh, guns and people in a cowering in the corner and person B who has this experience, right? And, and the, the thing is, is and the, the power of the medium is that I have one experience, you have another experience, that person over there has a third experience, but we're all experiencing this moment watching this film and we're bringing our various experiences into it and we're getting different things out of it, but that's okay. That's, that's entirely okay. A lot of, you know, uh, young storytellers are like, I thought of it, I conceived of it this way, I want everybody to follow it exactly that way. And they wind up talking down to their audience. 
You don't ever want to talk down to your audience. Our brother, you know, Spike Lee, who I know personally and, and love, as, well, that's a strong word, like uh, <laughs> as, as a person, as good peoples. Yeah, uh, I had his, his daughter in, in my class at NYU, also a very talented uh, filmmaker. But the one thing that he does that horrifies me in the filmic space is, is that it, he constantly talks directly to or down to his audience. He constantly says, this thing, I want you to know, I want you to see this middle finger you know, on the cup and know that I am giving the finger to the man or to the world in general. Now, yes, I did choose that cup intentionally, but I actually chose it because of this Ai Weiwei quote on the other side, which is, you know, important to me. Everything is art, everything is politics. And I totally agree with that. But I also agree with Ai Weiwei giving the finger to the world. So it, it's sort of a double double for me. But I would never put that, if I was gonna put that in a scene, I would put it very discreetly in the back, you know, where Spike tends to do those things where he puts them right in your face and forces you to deal with them. And that's one, one style of filmmaking. I, I personally don't agree with that because I believe that the mind, I have a theory about everything, right? And most of them I sort of label as Amerian theories because I realize that I am not gonna be incredibly, incredibly wealthy, but I, I do have this desire to turn myself into an adjective you know, like uh, Socrates or, or Plato. So I, I'm really pushing this, this idea of um, the Amerian viewpoint or Amerian politics. Or if you guys are just hanging out with your friends and somebody does something incredibly stupid and you're like, that is so Amerian. Like, I don't even care if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but just keep pushing my name out there. If you want to go to a basketball game when, you know, when we can do that sort of thing again and hold up one of those signs that says like Amirian 3.16, like, you know, fine, you know, do that. So um, one of my Amirian theories is that I believe in the first date rule of editing, right? So you have a scene, I, I want you to pretend like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm still, I'm still sharing the screen, let me do that. I want you to pretend like your audience is on a first date, right? And the cool thing, about being on a first date is that you're still flexing, right? I mean, it's sort of like a low-key flex, but you're still trying to do it. You're still trying to impress the person. So if the scene is, and this quite often, it, it did not happen actually in a Spike film, but it could happen in a Spike film. But you're trying to make the point, or a Spike is trying to make the point about five or let's say seven out of 10 black men have been through the criminal justice system, right? So 70% of brothers have been through the system. Instead of like putting like little hints down about that and allowing me on a first date with somebody sitting next to me to sort of turn to my date and say, you know, 70% of brothers have been through the criminal justice system, right? That allows me to be smart. That allows her or my date to be impressed. And now I'm sort of really invested in this film because you've given me the opportunity to sort of be smarter about it. I saw the things that you were putting down on the ground. I picked them up, I formed them in my mind and I created an opinion about it, which was the correct opinion. The problem is that in a Spike film, just before I'm about to turn to my date and say, you know, one of his characters leans into the screen, looks directly at the camera and says, 70% 70, 70 of black men have been through the criminal justice system. And I'm like, oh man, I was just about to say that. So give your opportunity to be smart. Lay down those little clues for them. They'll pick them up and they'll be invested in your film. And they'll also feel smart and they'll feel like your film is smart because you've allowed them to do that. So, um, okay. I am now gonna jump back to, uh, that, uh, that was all I wanted to say about that um, film school thing. I also will try to make all these links uh, available. So, um, like we said, filmmaking is this really sort of expansive thing. Your careers are going to have these incredible arcs from you know point A to point B. Uh, I wanted to show you um, a scene from the very beginning of my career. Uh, I got very lucky with uh, the first feature film that, uh, that I did, which uh, won at uh, Sundance uh, in '95 and also at, at, at Cannes, Cannes the following uh, year in '96. Well. It was basically the same season. Uh, but so this film is uh, about a, a young brother in DC who's, you know, writes some lyrics, you know, maybe wants to get in the music game. 
he's sort of in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, an OG in his neighborhood gets killed. Uh, and then he gets sort of swept up. And now he's in the system, right? He's one of those 70%, you know, 70% of black men, you know, that sort of thing, right? Uh, he, he, he's sort of now in the system. And before he knows it, and a lot of people don't know this, and that's the other thing you really have to consider. You want your audience to be smart, but sometimes you have to give them things, right? Like a lot of people don't know the difference between jail and prison, right? And so jail, you get in a fight at a bar tomorrow and the cops come, you get locked up, you're going to jail. You, you haven't actually been proven guilty of anything, but you go to jail. If you can afford bail, you get out of jail. If you can't afford bail, guess what? you're stuck in jail. And in DC, and a lot of our, our major urban center, centers, people are in jail for years because the caseloads are just backed up and backed up. So you, once again, you, are, you haven't done anything. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna take one quick second. Casey, I am now the administrator. If people are, are waiting to get in a room, I guess uh, I should admit them, correct? I'm just gonna go ahead and admit this person. Yep, Casey said, free them all or let them in. <laughs> um, so, um, right. So you're, you're, are, the cases are backlogged. You're in jail waiting for things and uh, jail could be a very dangerous place, right? So this, this brother, uh, Raymond Joshua is his character's uh, name played by the inimitable Saul Williams, uh, poet, the poet God. Uh, he goes into the DC jail system and immediately there is, you know, there's Southeast DC, AKA Anacostia, there's Northeast DC, there's different sections and those sections sort of exist in the jail. The, the, the public housing, you know, system sort of exists within the jail. And so oh, you've got to click up in order to, to sort of be protected. And, and so he's sort of experiencing that and he doesn't really, he, he just wants to be left alone. So this scene sort of takes place in the yard where he's being asked to make a decision. So that's the backdrop. I will give you this. I'm gonna choose this desktop and share. Oh. This motherfucking person. Yeah, we gotta handle that. When you come out, we got this chat. It's a motherfucking person. It's a person. Don't you know that nigga we beat down? Yeah. Yeah. You know we down with high for, right? Yeah. yeah, and they going against us because ain't nothing gonna stop this motherfucking drug game. I know. You know, stop none of my motherfucking business. Because we ain't having that shit. He's thug life for life. Okay. I got the word he down with Union Crew. We gonna get him, yeah. yeah He's down with Union Crew. And I don't like no bitch ass nigga cutting in my motherfucking business. You get what I'm saying? Dig, son. Dig, slow. Fuck that. I gotta push the steel in the motherfucking nigga. We gonna do that.
seen him here? Man, I want you to do the right thing, man. What the fuck is the right thing? The right thing is for me to just be my fucking self, you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's not hard about... to be yourself here, man. Come on, Rick. Come on, Rick. Look around, man. It's hard to be yourself in here, man. My crew gotta know where you stand at. I know where they standing at. Oh, fuck, nigga, this ain't no rites of passage or some shit. that shit. You see them lined up? We got our shit locked over here. Ain't nobody coming over here fucking with this shit. There's a place for you over here. If not, go the fuck over there with your friend then. All right, look, let's not get too close, you know what I mean? rocks, drinking 40s of Mother Earth's private nectar stock, dodging cops, cause 5 be the 666, and I need a fix of that purple rain, the type of shit that drives membranes insane, oh yeah, I'm in the fast lane, snorting candy yams, that free my body and soul and send me like Shazam, never question who I am, God knows, and I know God personally, in fact, he lets me call him me, yeah, I'm serious, B, doggone niggas plotted shit lovely, but the feds is also plotting me. They're trying to imprison my astrology. Put our stars behind bars, our stars in stripes, using blood splattered banners as nationalist kites. But I control the wind. That's why they call it the hawk. I am Horus, son of Isis, son of Osiris, worshiped as Jesus, resurrected like Lazarus. But you can call me lazy, lazy. Yeah, I'm lazy because I'd rather sit and build than work a plow field, worshiping a daily yield of cash green crops. Stealing us was the smartest thing they ever did. Too bad they don't teach the truth to their kids. Our influence on them is the reflection they see when they look into their menstrual mirror and talk about their culture. Their existence is that of a schizophrenic vulture. Yeah, there's no repentance. They are bound to live an infinite consecutive executive life sentence. So what are you bound to live, nigga? So while you're out there serving the time and be, I'll be in sync with the sun while you run from the moon. Life of the womb reflected by guns. Worship of moons, I am the sun. And and we are public enemies number one. One, one, one. One, one, one. I forgot what the fuck I was thinking. All right. Uh, sorry, I'm a stop the share and go back to this. So remember I was saying early on about how you um, you have to look inside your own personal stories, your own personal experience and connect to, to your character's experiences, right? Like if you can find that point of connection between your life and the character's life, then you can sort of give it to, to everybody else to, to, uh, to sort of connect in, in their lives. So. This was the first film I edited, first, you know, big film. Um, you know, I'd cut short films and whatnot before. Uh, so there was that, there was that sort of pressure. But then there was also the thing, I tangentially knew the star of this film. 
right? Right. So Saul Williams went to Morehouse when uh, my sister was at Spelman. And so, uh, you know, my sister came back, you know, her sophomore year, you know, your sophomore year, you sort of go through your, your black power phase and she was, she was all amped and she had this poetry journal, you know, I'm gonna just borrow this copy of the green book, but she had the journal like in her hand and she was like, check out what we're doing. You know, this is our journal, Red Clay. And so I looked at it and I'm her big brother, right? So I gotta be an asshole. So I was just like, I was reading, I was like, yeah, crap, crap redundant, you know, want to be Nikki Giovanni crap, crap, you know, and as I kept flipping uh, through, sort of tearing down everything. And, and then I got to this one poem and I was just like, this is good though. This is good. And I took note of the kid's name for whatever reason, his name was Saul Williams, right? So then I go for the interview for this film, uh, Slam, which I, honestly, I was interviewing as, a, as an associate editor or a, a super assistant. I walk into the meeting and I'm the only person of color. I'm the only person under the age of 30, you know, in the room. And they show me basically a, a version, a really raw version of this scene with a much longer version of that poem. And now Saul's language is deeply and densely encoded in the African-American experience, right? And even though he and I are peers for the most part, I only understand like 87% of what he's talking about. And so I'm looking at these older white men in the room and I'm like, these motherfuckers, no, 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 no. And so I felt like not only am I going to get this job, I'm going to protect this cat's work, right? Like I, I, I am now the guardian of what he's trying to say, right? So that was one point of connection. So then I get the job and, you know, I start doing well and they're like, they stopped looking for, uh, honestly, they hired me and they were like, they, they, uh, Mark Levin, the director was like, I like you. I like working with you. I don't know if you have the experience to pull this off. You know, I'm going to keep looking. Fine. So I sat in a chair and once I got in the chair, I was like, I'm not getting out of this chair. I'm not, I'm not getting out of the, the big uh, editor chair. And then Mark and I discovered that we were both Nick fans. You, newsflash to some of you who are younger. Uh, there was a time period where the Knicks were actually good, like really good and won lots of games and went to playoffs and stuff like that. So there are working process was that we would work together up until 7 30 p.m and then it was game time and we'd order some food and we'd watch the next play and if they won we were amped and we would stay and we would continue to work until like 2 a.m in the morning if they lost we were like later for this and we'd turn around and go home so luckily for us uh, that was a time you know when the knicks were going to the playoffs and they were winning 55 games a year or whatever and they, you know um, unfortunately being dispatched by michael jordan and the bulls deep in the playoffs, but whatever. So we cut this film and there were a lot of late nights and a lot of like amped up the next one and we're gonna cut and cut and cut, right? So that was a, 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 another point of personal connection. But I, I didn't know how to wrestle with the, this film is basically a musical with the poetry as the music scenes, right? And so I was just like, how do I do this? Because how do I rationalize having a scene in a prison yard and all of a sudden, a guy who's about to be stabbed with a shiv in the back breaks into poem, and somehow it's all okay, right? And I was really having a problem with that. I was like, this is stupid. If I was watching this film, I'd be like, you see that? That's some bullshit, right? That's some Hollywood nonsense because that would never happen. And then I remembered a conversation that my mother had with my sister, five years younger than me, so she was probably about 14 at the time, just starting to, you know, become a woman and potentially, not potentially, probably definitely be harassed uh, on the city streets. And she was like, if somebody's following you and you can't get to a safe space, just start talking to yourself and scratching yourself and acting crazy. Because nobody really wants to attack a crazy person. Definitely no man wants to get with a crazy person. Now, that may or may not be true, but you know, that, that was the advice that she gave to my younger sister. So I'm thinking about that rattling around in my head. Now, there's not a, well, there's one woman uh, in this scene, which we'll get to in a second. But I, I was like, okay, that makes sense for me. It made sense for me when my mom said it to my sister. But if this guy is being stalked and then does, if he turns around and tries to throw a punch at that dude, that guy is ready for that. He's expecting that. He's not expecting him to break out into a poem. And if he does the unexpected thing, 
that's probably going to stun everybody. And once I had sort of a, a, a template for telling a story that made sense, now I could start to cut it. Now I was looking for all these little reaction shots that I could sort of repurpose as shock and awe and, and not awe, but, you know, sort of amazement as what was going on. So as like, boom, once I had the template, now I could sort of fit this in. Now, the one thing that you really have to understand about this scene, I'm going to screen share in a second and go back to like two or three moments. But the one thing you really have to understand, this film was made by a documentarian, right? He was actually in DC shooting a documentary for HBO about the closing of the DC jail system and the fact that they were selling, selling prisoners or bodies to other jails, right? So they had X amount of people in their jail system. They wanted to reduce their, reduce their budget and close their jail system. But well, what do we do with these 35,000 prisoners? Huh, Ohio's got 312 beds. So they would ship these brothers, mostly brothers, from DC to Ohio to sort of be, you know, be in their jail system. It was like really criminal what, what was going on. So, you know, they're, they're shipping these people back and forth. And so he's down there telling that story. And while he's telling that story, he had this other thing that had been percolating in his head, which was, is, he wanted to tell this larger story, which was actually the story of Bones Malone, who you see in the scene dressed in the bathrobe as one of the, 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 the gangsters or leaders of the, the jail gangs. Um, and they had sort of started workshopping that idea and they, they were gonna do it with Bones in the lead. And then unfortunately, Bones got locked up for some, well, he's a member of the low life crew and he got macked up, locked up for some nonsense, but they couldn't actually shoot. So then he's down there doing his documentary and they were like, can I do two things at once? So, so they started making Slam on HBO's dime, not telling them, saying, hey, we have to do another shoot in DC. So going down to DC to shoot this documentary and then sliding, you know, this film and the shooting of this film in. And so they brought Saul Williams down as a production assistant to get him into the jail. And then once they got him into the jail, there was a cipher uh, going on. Uh, flashback to uh, 90s hip hop language. A cypher is when uh, a bunch of MCs get in a circle and, and rhyme, for those of you that don't know. Uh, if, uh, for those of you who are trap rapper fans, uh, you know, and, anyway, I'm not gonna get on my old man hip hop shit. Um, right, so they, they were in this cypher. They put Saul on the edge of the cypher and he sort of jumped in with his sort of like, you know, very comedic, you know, uh, uh, uber intellectual style of rap. And the dudes were like, yo, I don't know who this dude, but he's down with us. Uh, and once they did that, they were like, okay, now we can make this film. So they talked to the warden of the jail. She was like, I'm out of a job in six months. I don't care, come on down, shoot this film, tell the truth. And so once you know that, and let me go back to screen sharing here. Once you know that, you realize that Everybody in this scene, right? All of these people here in the yard, they're all prisoners, right? They're all, oh, damn it, I keep forgetting to hit share. Okay, so all these people in the yard are all prisoners. The only actors are Saul Williams, uh, the guy who's playing Raymond Joshua, uh, the guy who is playing the guard standing on the thing, and then Bones Malone, who is indeed an actor, or, but uh, is also very familiar with the jail system after having spent you know, a year or two in Rikers, right? So all these people don't really know what's going on. They see the cameras, but they don't really know what's going on. And then there's a couple of people that they hired, like, some of these principal people like here, this brother right here on the weight bench, his name is China, right? So he's, he has speaking lines, but he's not actually, you know, an actor. He's a, 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 a prisoner uh, awaiting trial, right? Uh, who is a bit, and giving a part, given a part in this film. And he does very, very well. So well, in fact, that when this film went to Sundance, people loved, let me go back to a better part, right? So China has this speech that he delivers right here in the very beginning, right? We gonna get him, yeah. yeah. He's down with union proof. And I'm like, no bitch ass nigga cutting in my motherfucking business. Right? So, so China's got abs for days. He's got a feral uh, intensity. And people, after we won at Sundance, people were like, the agents were like, who is this actor? We must have him. We must get in contact. Get, 
you know, give us his information. Like, how, how do we get in contact with him? And we were like, yeah, you can't get in contact with China. And they were like, no, 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 I work for CAA. I can get in contact with anybody. We were like, China just got sentenced to 27 years at Lorton Correctional Facility. Believe me, you cannot get in contact with China. And if you did get in contact with China, you probably would regret it, right? So, uh, so yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, there was a, a, an urgency to the scene because there were real people in it doing real things, uh, behaving like themselves, right? And then I was able to sort of, once I had the template in my mind, this is uh, Sonia Sohn. Many of you might actually know her from The Wire. She played Detective uh, Kima Griggs uh, in The Wire and a bunch of other roles. Uh, but she sort of started off uh, as a poet, was in that poetry scene. And uh, uh, so that's why she's, she's in the film. But once, uh, once, I, once I created that template in my mind that, uh, that my mom had given me or had given to my sister, I started using things that, now this film was shot on film, on Super 16 film, right? So there are, there are th things that are no longer happen in the digital realm, but there's this thing in film called the rollout, right? Your film is this long, and once you get to the end of the film, it literally rolls out. But once it rolls out, these really interesting things happen, like more light comes into the frame, it comes into the body of the camera, and you get these little, little sort of like in-camera like explosions. I am a end of the frame editor, right? I don't just want the part that the cinematographer and the director wanted to give me. I want everything because I'm going to use everything. So this scene is sort of a really classic example of me sort of using everything, right? So all of this stuff when Saul. <laughs> how the like even when when uh bones's character hoffa uh is saying you've seen him here this is this is a shot that in many hollywood films they would have thrown out because there's an aperture change and the the scene sort of goes from slightly you know dark to the uh, the, the cameraman is changing the aperture and more light is being lit. So, seen him here but for me that's an effect Right, he's saying like, seen him here, and there's actually like a spotlight is sort of shine on him. So I was like, yeah, I'll take that. It's technically a mistake, but I'll take it and use it uh, to my advantage. And I try to do that consistently throughout this scene. One, because I have to, right? I can't afford to be throwing out, I have a limited amount of cutaways because this is an independent film and it's being shot in a jail with like no permission, right? So I got to use whatever I have. What I'm saying, I mean, it's not about- be yourself here, man. Look around, man. It's hard to be yourself in here, man. Okay, so one other big sort of uh, Amerian take is that I don't believe that all language is created equal, right? I know writers write like every single thing I write on this page is the gospel, and I want my characters to deliver it as if these words are extremely important. Right, that's how they write, and I get that. And I, I'm not really a writer, so I, I, don't, I don't want to disrespect that process. But once I get into the edit room, I understand that audiences don't care about all words; they only care about some words in the sentence. So, blah 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 blah. It's hard to be yourself in here, man. It's hard to be yourself in here. That's a takeaway line for me, right? Like. They're in jail. They haven't actually been convicted of anything, but they're in jail and he's trying to be himself. And this, this other brother who has this knowledge is saying, look, man, first of all, I'm wearing a bathrobe, right? So you know I'm, I'm legit because uh, I'm wearing a bathrobe in the middle uh, of, a, of a prison yard. Two, I'm gonna tell you right now, it's hard to be yourself in here. If you don't remember anything else about this scene, if you remember that, I've done my job, right? As a storyteller, because you, you you took the took away the takeaway and you took it away with you, right? And so that that's super important. Um, okay, so let's get back to here. This is another like sort of classic mistake. I wish that the cinematographer would have landed. Ah, shit, locked over here. Ain't nobody coming over. Right? He didn't actually land shot. 
He didn't. I went back and forth, back and forth, taking this out, putting it away. I didn't have anything better. I left it in. I'm glad I did uh, because there are no real mistakes if the audience sort of gets it, right? Um, but Let once we get to- continue kind of scrubbing through, we just yep. want to make sure we take questions from our students because we're yeah. over on time a little bit. So we just want to make sure we get it getting to folks. No questions. problem. I'll, I'll finish up. We could get to the to the yeah, Q and A, and I don't mind staying longer. That's that's fine thank too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So, in terms of dealing with the documentary aspect, and a lot, and the reason why I show this to aspiring filmmakers is because this is similar to a lot of the films that you, you'll be making. Where, you know, you've got some money that you borrowed from your grandma and you got a camera and you're borrowing and you're repurposing some of your family members to turn them into actors and, and stuff like that. And so there's gonna be a very rough hewn nature to it. But as long as you're sort of consistent in the story that you're trying to tell, people, your audience does not care. The, the, the cultural critic, good friend of mine, Greg Tate, once said about being a movie critic, is that at the end of the day, a lot of smart people start throwing around a lot of smart terms and it really is just two hours in the fucking dark, right? You really just want your audience to sink into your world and spend two hours in the dark with you. And if you're, if you're willing to allow them to do that, they will willingly do that, right? So as many mistakes, as classic cinema mistakes as there are in this scene and in the production of the film, if you sink into the film, if you sink into this brother Raymond Joshua's sense of aloneness at this moment, then you're willing to, to believe that. And I believe that this section right here really does that because I want you to feel like he's being hunted. And I use every little sort of trick at my disposal, every little single frame of the film to, to do this. I'm gonna play this and I'll just talk over the top of it. <laughs> Let's not get too close, you know what I mean? Right, one, I didn't know you could actually get blunts in prison, but apparently that's a thing. Uh, so the, the only thing I want you to take out of this scene is the absurdity of, of them smoking blunts in the middle of the prison yard, but also he got to go. He got to go. Once again, all the other language is it, it just sort of background noise for me. As long as you get that, that these guys, this guy, uh, this, this very artfully ripped uh, t-shirt and, and, and the main uh, hunter, China, uh, that they uh, that they're trying to get rid of it. Everybody, huh? I want everybody huh? some of that shit. It's the thug in Once again, I wish I saw what the cinematographer was trying to do. I wish he had lined it up perfectly that like Saul or Raymond Joshua's head was behind the bag. He didn't actually nail it, but you you sort of get the point, right? And so I slow it down, add a few boxing bag uh, sound effects and the audience gets the point right there. He's sort of, you know, in this sort of dangerous situation. Right, not an effect. That's just a cameraman whip panning to like get the camera to a, a different situation. And I take that whip pan from one shot, put it right after the final hit of the boxing bag and, and it becomes a quasi effect. So I'm going to show you one thing. Right, 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 right. Okay, so I have a favorite cut in every film that I've ever done, right? And this one, so at a certain point, there are two cameras rolling, but at a certain point, they are fixing something with camera two. And Saul has nothing to do, or at least he thinks that he's not being shot. Now, as I said, he's the only actor in this scene. Like, all of these brothers are actual prisoners. So he's in the middle of the yard and he's feeling alone and he, the actor, is legitimately afraid or at least a little uneasy 
So he goes to the body, the, um, he goes to the volleyball net, and he wants to put his back up against something. And I'm like, oh, I can use Saul's spear to actually be Raymond Joshua's spear. This is not like a, you know, a Stanislavski technique that he's doing as an actor. This is him as a human being actually being scared in a situation. And, and us in the edit room saying, okay, we're going to take your fear and turn it into the character's fear. And it works out really well because... <laughs> And I'm able to use that little whip pan, right? Where it whips and you see him sort of sitting there and then cut back to the other shot that I have and he's readjusting his body. And that combination of things makes the audience feel very uneasy and, and not necessarily uneasy for themselves because the camera is whipping back and forth, but you feel uneasy for this character. And if you can do that in the other room, you can take a, a sense of uneasiness because uh, big takeaways, uh, sort of statement. As an editor, there are three things that are being sort of known or disseminated. You know, there's what the character knows, there's what the audience knows, and there's what you in the edit room know. And what you in the edit room know is sort of omnipotent, right? Like I, I know everything, and I can sort of dispense things out. I can say, oh, oh the character knows this because I showed this sign or I showed this cutaway, and now the audience knows this because. I cut away to another scene, and now the character doesn't know what's going on in this other scene, but the audience does. So like the audience knows this, the character knows that, I'm sort of going back and forth. Sometimes the character's ahead of the audience, sometimes the audience ahead of the character, but we, the storytellers, we know it all, and we're sort of moderating what the other two, two people know, right? But if I can make you in the audience feel what the character is feeling in this scenario, then we're sort of doing our job, okay. All right, I, I said that was gonna be the last thing, but there's just one other thing I wanna point out. Um, when we were shooting this, when he starts to do the poem. Stars and stripes using blood splattered banners as nationalist kite. Okay, so you can see that everybody else is still in the yard and they're sort of looking around like, like what's going on. The warden of the jail who started to fancy herself as a Hollywood uh, studio mogul at some point, comes down just in the, in the middle of this scene and says, what are you guys doing out here? I didn't give you permission to be out here. Pack up your shit and go. You got to go. So they go. They're a little like nonplussed. They come back the next day. They're shooting in the library. And she comes down and says, hey, you remember that scene in the yard that you were doing yesterday? You should do that today. And they're like, uh, uh, okay. And so now they go down to the yard, but there's nobody in the yard. So now that's a huge continuity problem, right? Like in one scene, you have, this performance and there's like, you know, 500 people in the yard. And now you have this other scene where they're delivering the poem and there's nobody in the yard. So they decided to shoot it a little bit closer. And I had to intercut the two of them and make the, the, it, feel, it feel like as if it was all going on on one day. So when you're watching this- Put poem, our stars behind bars, our stars in stripes, using blood splattered banners as nationalist kites. But I control the wind. That's why they call it the hawk. I am Horus, son of Isis, son of Osiris, worshiped as Jesus, resurrected like Lazarus. But you can call me lazy, lazy. Yeah, I'm lazy because I'd rather sit and build than work a plow field, worshiping a daily yield of cash, green crops. Stealing us was the smartest thing they ever did. Too bad they don't teach the truth to their kids. Our influence on them is the reflection they see when they look into their menstrual mirror and talk about their culture. Their existence is that of a schizophrenic vulture. Yeah, there's no repentance. They are bound to live an infinite consecutive executive life sentence. So what are you bound to live, nigga? So while you're out there serving the time and be, I'll be in sync with the sun while you run I'm sorry, I guess it was in the first half. Uh, I thought it was in the, in the latter half. Ah. He lets me call him me, yeah. Okay, so this is actually day two. So you can see there's actually, there's nobody playing volleyball here in the background. You, you hear people, that's the magic of filmmaking, right? So I sort of, uh, I layered in the sounds from day one, but this is actually- I'm serious. Two. Right? Be There's nobody, the filmmakers are shooting it a little tighter uh, so that uh, it feels, the frame feels more fill, full, but all those background- Don't go on niggas plotted shit, there, love! Right? There's nobody on the weight benches, nobody over there doing, uh, you know, push-ups. But you know, the feds is also plotting me! Right, and now I, I, I cut away to, you know, to Sonia at the door, and that also- They're trying to imprison my astrology, put our stars behind-
and now I'm back to, to I'm sorry, um, that was also on day two. Now I'm back to day one because you can, you can see this, this guy here sitting, sitting in the background. So a little bit of, you know, creative license, uh, but it, it also, you know, it pays off uh, at the end. Um, I, I, yeah, I, uh, I wanted to show you something from the, what I'm doing right now, but I don't think we have time for that. So why don't we go to the Q&A? Thank you. I mean, it's so interesting to see, to hear the backstory, because it's, it's so rare that you see, get the context for the cuts, um, you know, and one of the things that really um, resonated, like when I kind of described the process of filmmaking, um, I always say, well, you know, if the, if the story is a mural, right, the director is like the artist, the cinematographer is the paint, the paintbrush, and the, produ the producer, like, gets the paint, you know, a lot of times gets the artist, the idea sometimes, but the editor, if the painting is a mural, is the one who kind of sees how the painting is going to go, and then listening to you just now, it was like, wait, but they're also like looking at like the random splashes of paint and the little like fleckles and the little like hair brushes and just taking everything in the disposal, at the disposal, in addition to the pieces that have been rendered. So that was really, really interesting to hear just how you kind of um, took that kind of, even the, the documentary kind of context and environment and use that to really give this narrative even more texture. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, mm -hmm. really appreciative of how you kind of broke down the scene and the different aspects of um, that production in particular. Um, one of the questions that I'm sure is like burning for everyone is just like the editing process, like some of the main differences between cutting for documentaries and cutting for narrative. You know, one of the things that we always hear is like, with nonfiction, mainly, you know, that, that the story is made in the cutting room, right? Like you may have an idea yeah. or a treatment, but then it's like when you actually see what was shot, you're able to like really kind of take the story, you know, off to a different like dimension. And that's where the story is made versus like kind of having this guide of the script. And again, another point that you made about like, when you're cutting together and you're kind of reworking the script and kind of going back to the page and reordering the page. But what would you like distill as some of the main differences between cutting for fiction versus nonfiction? Um, I, I have far more experience with, with cutting nonfiction. Uh, uh, yes, we're cutting nonfiction, we're do cutting documentary. But I try to treat documentary in as dramatic a way as possible. So I think the one thing that you have to do for documentary is you have to get a script, right? So you have to have all of your interviews transcribed, which is very expensive, you know, you know, unless you yourself have those, you know, 200 words a minute, you know, lightning finger skills, you know, to like listen to all of your interviews and transcribe word for word what they're saying and lay it down. And that becomes a sort of a searchable document. And then you can start to cut and paste and create you know, I had this this um, this uh, this interview with Tamika, you know, on Friday, and then we did another interview with her in the car, and you have all that stuff, and you start to cut and paste and create a, a script for yourself. And then once you have that script, then you can sort of, you know, create like what, what they call a radio cut, you know, just sort of, you're not necessarily worried visuals, you just want the people saying the words, putting it on screen. Once you have that script, then it's really like cutting a, a narrative at that point, right? You're sort of adapting the script and changing it. With narratives for me, and like I said, I have uh, much less of that on my resume. And then honestly, being an East Coast editor, our films here are really like documentaries, right? Because it's like a, 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 a 27 to one uh, ratio of like, you know, a scene ratio. And so, so there's like 27 different takes and you know, people are freestyling, you know, like even this, this slam was technically a narrative but it was all sort of shot, you know, on the run style. So there really was no script, right? They were sort of making things up as they go. And we, we were sort of playing off of that uh, in the edit room. And I find that a lot of independent East Coast films are similar to that. So I sort of cut them like documentaries. But I think that if you do have a script, be respectful of the script. Let your first cut honor the script. If a writer wrote something and the actors recited those words that the, wrote, that the writer wrote, 
I'm always respectful of that process, even if I don't agree with it, right? I lay it all out and I create a version and I allow the director or the producer or the writer in some cases to look at it and go, huh, that doesn't really work. And as soon as they say that, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, it's interesting. I thought that too, and I have this, ta-da, this other version of this scene where I sort of adapted the script a little bit, where I kind of threw out all those meaningless words that you wrote down and created and crafted it. And of course that scene, I mean, editors are hustlers just like anybody else, right? We're trying to manipulate people, et cetera, et cetera. So their scene, the respecting the script scene, I sort of laid out very basically. My scene, I spent a little bit more time with, maybe I dropped some music in, maybe I added some, you know, some sound effects, et cetera, et cetera. So it's that emotional manipulation of like, this scene seems better than, than that one, right? But I do like to, to, to uh, honor and respect the script. So there are differences, but ultimately, you're just trying to tell a story, you know, uh, between the two. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, um, just to your point, is that the focus on character, like, it's like, I used to think of it as kind of very different as well, but at the, in both of them, it's like, you really are just trying to arc a character, arc a story, get people right. invested. So, you know, thank you for kind of like marrying those, yeah. those ideas here. You know, um, I have a bunch more questions too, but I want to make sure I get to everyone else's questions. Um, does anyone else have a question that they'd like to ask Amir? Get in there, Alexander. It, it looks like. Well, it's not, oh, okay. it's not really a question. I, I just want to say what you did with the background when you added that in the little poem, I think that was, I think that was um, a really, a really clever thing to do, especially since um, nobody would notice because we're we all we it, it's it's the tone and we're all here to just go to the movies. We're not, unless you're one of those people who want to point out the mistakes in the movies, you just want to watch the movie. I didn't even notice that. Even even if I try to look out for it I was I wasn't even noticed it because I was too glued to the film that was a that was a very smart idea this way thank you for saying that and this may be a, a slightly inappropriate people uh, uh, answer but we know those people right the, those people ex exist in the corners of reddit uh, who are willing to say in this amazing scene of Lord of the Rings with 10,000 orcs screaming down the mountain and they're like Oh my God, there's a car for two frames up in the top right corner. Fuck those people. Like, we don't make movies for those people. Like, yes, occasionally, you know, it's the, it's the Starbucks cup uh, sitting next to Daenerys in Game of Thrones. It's funny, you know, and if you watch your, your, your show on slow-mo and look at every frame, you're going to catch these mistakes. But... I'm not watching movies for that. I'm watching movies or scenes to be transported. Now, that being saying, if there are large egregious errors, then that's on us. That's on us as filmmakers to sort of fix that. But two frames of, of something, you know, that people want to point out, I, yeah, I'm not, yeah, those people are going to be there, but I, I don't worry about them. And you, you shouldn't worry about them either. Make your film for your crew, for your people, you know. Don't, don't worry about the, the people on, on Reddit, you know, so. Excellent, excellent. I think Danny had a question. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, apologies if we made any interruptions before with our audio. Uh, everybody listening, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Hope it didn't take away Don't worry. Um, and thank you, Amir, for going over on time. I'm, I'm really, we really oh, no appreciate problem. that. Now, um, I, I've only edited a couple of times, but every time I have, I've gotten so into it and tons of hours and going back and you know, redoing what I did and questioning it. So I always thought editing, maybe it's a process better served if you have somebody, have a second pair of eyes come on and look it over with you, especially as a beginner. So I'd just like to hear your opinion on that. Is, should, should us yeah. novices bring in somebody or should we keep trying to go at it alone? I definitely, I, I, I have a ton of opinions on that. And just, if you could just leave your arms, just like, no, 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 that's bad. See, if you could leave your arm just like that, where you're covering up that horrible Patriots logo, because that, that's just absolutely distracting me. I, I, I just can't get behind, you know, Brady and uh, Belichick. I, I, suffered and the, the, I suffered the 90s days with the 
minutes with you, so please give me credit on that. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll give, I'll give you props for that. I'll give you props for that. So, yes, I absolutely, the great thing about filmmaking is that it is collaborative, that you are bringing in another set of eyes. I understand the desire to people to, because as artists, we're like, this is my story. I wrote it. I directed it. I acted it. I acted in it. Of course, I should edit in it. I should edit it, brother. And if you are a sculptor, that makes perfect sense to me. It's you and the wood or the rock in your chisel, and you're creating your vision out of it. But filmmaking really affords us the ability to be collaborative and to bring in an extra set of eyes and have somebody tell you, yeah, I know you think that, but that's not really the story. What if we did this? And there will be arguments, there'll sometimes be fisticuffs uh, uh, in the edit room. I, I have in my edit rooms this thing called the, um, the EDH, which is the edit decision hoop. And it's like a little Nerf basketball hoop that I set up. And if, if a director and I, you know, ever really get to a situation where it's just like, let's just take it to the hoop and we just shoot, shoot free throws, you know? Now, of course, I spend far more time in the edit room than the director does. So I'm constantly in there practicing like every day. So that, that's how I win, you know, most of those battles. But, you know, they're, they're, but even that process of arguing, right? And so you're coming at it from the director point of view, right? I'm coming at it from the editorial point of view. I like to think of myself as the captain of the boat. And you're like, oh, no, 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 I, I'm the director, I'm the captain. It's like, no, no, you're the owner of the boat. I'm the captain and the driver of the boat, right? So you as a director tell me, let's take my yacht that I own to Cancun. And I'm like, okay, but you know, Danny, I saw on the radar, the fancy super duper radar, that there's a, st a storm in between us and Cancun. And you're like, yeah, yeah don't worry about that. Don't worry about that, we're, let, let's go to Cancun. And I'm like, dude, if we go to Cancun, we're going to die, right? And so then I have to decide as the editor, as the, the captain of the boat, do I ride through this storm and potentially die or do I jump off this boat and say, you take this boat and, and go to Cancun. And there have been times in the edit room where I've jumped off the boat and there have been times where I've put my head down, listened to the director and gone through and then, in some of those situations, if I'm being perfectly honest, the storm has dissipated and we arrived in Cancun and it was fabulous. And then I have to turn to the director and say, you know what, you were right. But it, it is that process, it is that back and forth of arguing over things, of being willing to almost jump off the boat uh, and, and not sacrifice yourself, you know? It, I think that is super important. So if you can afford it, and I know that editors are very expensive, but if you can afford it, get somebody to come in with you and be a second pair of eyes. Now, with that in mind, treat that hiring process like, like you would, no, don't treat it like Tinder. Don't just swipe and take the, the available, you know, I'm sorry, you're probably not on Tinder, Tinder because you're sitting next to somebody right, that is very lovely. So yeah, so strike that, that's, that's the wrong, that, that is the wrong thing. But I'm just, the, the marriage between an editor and director is very much like any other, like a very real marriage, right? So you wanna choose the right person. You wanna choose the person that will fight with you, but that person is also fighting for you. So get the right editor. If you get the right editor, all the ups and downs, it, it all sort of wipes away when you're standing on stage at Sundance or Can or Tribeca or, or, or whatever, right? If you get the wrong editor, it could be, you know, detrimental. If you get somebody who's just looking for a check, then then that's not really where I you you want somebody who's fighting your for your film just as hard as you're fighting for the film. And you you guys just just have a slight disagreement about how to raise your child. Let, let's put it that way. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to piggyback, like, don't be afraid to hang out with the fo the person because you know, just outside of the cutting room because. You know, again, like Amir said, you know, this is such a collaborative medium. You'll see different sides of each other. You know, again, there's, my friend always says, there's a film you write, the film you shoot, and the film you cut, right? And it's like, when you, if you're the one person doing all of those three things, like, it's a lot of anxiety. We call it killing your babies when you have to, like, edit your own work. 
So, but when you do kind of go to those partnerships and collaborations, you know, you want to try to get to know these people in different spaces because you're going to have to be vulnerable. You're going to have to be transparent. And, you know, like, I mean, hopefully you have time to do that. A lot of times you're just right in the edit room, but like Amir can testify, like you're spending so many hours with this person. So you want to try to build some trust. Um, and you know, Naeem, Naeem and I were just commenting on how golden that yacht analogy is. We'll be using many of these Amerians as, as we go forward, but um, good luck with your film. And you know, we want to take um, Lex's question as well. Sure. Lex, you still there? My bad. No worries. Um, I'm just asking as someone who's, I've never touched an editing program. Uh, not even once, and I haven't been the person behind the camera ever. I'm just a writer. I'm a storyteller, and yeah, I'm just wondering how to jump into that as a writer. Like, what constructive criticism have you held back from other writers that you've met trying to get into the editing space? Huh. Well, as I was saying early on, and I, I saw that you were one of the first people uh, here um, for the class, um, that, that thing about writing and editing really being similar and being the same, almost the same process. So I don't know, this, so there's a film, a, a film, um, a, a really good TV show called This Is Us, right? Oh, yeah, uh, that's that's on uh, NBC, it's fantastic. A lot of people love it. It's multiple parallel storylines uh, going on. They're jumping back and forth. Uh, one of my friends time, are in that. One of your friends is on that? Yeah, um, she she plays with this R.L. Sterling. I, I forgot what the dude's oh, name is. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But does she play the, the daughter? The daughter of him. The daughter oh, of him, Chris Baker. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, so I was watching the show for the first time, and I loved it immediately. And then I watched, like, the second episode. I think I loved it because, and, and this will, will be important to Danny, I loved it because the characters, uh, the main characters live in Pittsburgh and they are Steelers fans, uh, as am I. Uh, and so I bonded with the show immediately, right? So, but then I was watching the second episode and I noticed the, the credits for the first time and it said, uh, uh, you know, uh, executive producer or produced by Shakri Hassan. And I was like, I know Shakri. I, I, I've known him for a long time and I knew him as a documentarian. Uh, and I also knew him because he called me to say, hey, uh, 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 I'm starting to edit, you know, like reality TV, blah, blah, blah. I mean, so we talked to him. So I knew him as this and also as an editor, but not as a writer. So I immediately, you know, hit him up on social media. I was like, yo, bro, like I saw your credit. I was like, are you working on This Is Us? He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, and are you in the right? He said, yeah, I'm in the writer's room. I was like, you're in the writer's room? He was like, yeah. Oddly enough, they actually thought that my experience as an editor was valuable writing experience. And I was like, go ahead. Like, that's super, super impressive. And once, and then he actually wrote an article on it for one of the trade magazines where he broke it down even more. So your background as a writer and as a storyteller makes you an editor, right? It is not about pushing buttons. It really is about telling your story and there, if you can, I don't know what your preferred method of, of writing is, but if you can run a word processor, uh, uh, you know, you can learn to be an editor. And then the other thing is that you, you don't actually, as a creative, as, as a storyteller, as a, a filmmaker, um, a director, you don't have to know how to edit. You have to have a sense of the process, right? Like, uh, I'm sorry, where are you, Lex, there you are. Le Lex, do you, do you have a, a driver's license? Uh, oh, no, I don't. You, oh, you don't. Okay. All right. So then it sort of ruins my analogy. But <laughs> what, I, <laughs> what I was going to say is that e even if you have a driver's license and you know how to drive, most people don't know what the hell their carburetor does. And you can be a right. very good driver, even though you don't know what your carburetor does or how to break it apart and, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. You, you know, so think of it in that regard. You can be a great storyteller, a great filmmaker, and the editor is your mechanic who knows what the carburetor does and how to fix the carburetor. But you don't have to know that because you're just driving your car and you're, you're gonna drive it safely and get it from point A uh, to point B. 
you know. So it's like you don't have to know everything. You have to know the larger thing. You know, this is my story. It, it, it's starting here, and I want to get it to here. And then your editor becomes either equal parts your mechanic to help you get the car from point A to point B, uh, or the other thing uh, is that your your uh, editor is, is like your driver, you know, helping you get that car. But you still have a sense of where you want that car to go. So uh, don't don't be scared by the technology. That that's not really what it's all about. It's all about you telling your story. I'm like I love the story that you're telling right now, like just outside with the trees and the sun in the background, uh, look like you were sitting like poolside. I was like, I want to be in that story. I want to be part of that story, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, the empty right. pool. That's a really right, great right. point. Um, just the fact that like, you know, everyone's, everyone, that's why it's so, it's so important to have like a story that you believe in. Because then you get your team on board and they bring, you know, their specialties, but they, like we're all working to tell like to strengthen that story so like even like a someone who does color correction like they're using color to tell right. the same story right. a sound designer is using sound to tell yes. the, the same right. story so like all of these things like they overlap um in the post-production process so right now you're using the page to tell the story right. but yeah. that will speak to your abilities to use the editing editing software as well. Like there's so much overlap, you know, but at the same time, you all, you know, you bring a specialty. So even as um, Zanny was saying, you know, he's wearing multiple hats, but like in this, com in this editing conversation, you now know like some of the most poignant mo moments that you're gonna find are before and after the take, right? Like those are some of the most natural moments before you help you yell action and, and cut because that's when people are themselves and you hearing Amir say like that, that those are some of the greatest moments that I was able to cut in. So, you know, it's great that you're kind of pushing yourself to, to learn more about, to, to, to think outside about them more, learn more about parts of storytelling that you're not necessarily familiar with because it'll just um, foster better conversation. And, you know, and then as you go, go on and attempt to do it, all of these things will give you more context. Um, so right. we will, we're going to start to kind of wrap the class. Um, Alexander, I, I, see, yeah, I see that one more question about how, yeah. how many days does it take you to edit a film? Um, I will tell you this, there really is, I, I wish there was a set answer, right? So the film that I'm doing right now uh, is a, a PBS documentary, a historical documentary for, for Rick Burns. Uh, brother of Ken Burns, and they, they make very similar types of films, big sweeping historical films. But this film is called Driving While Black, uh, a, a history of African-American, or, 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 you know, a history of race, space, and mobility uh, in America, right? So it's a very different type of, you know, Burns uh, film. And so we're making our film, and the interesting thing about working with a Burns brother in the public television system is that they're kind of like OGs, right? They're kind of like gods in that system. So there really is no oversight, right? So I'm, I'm used to studio head saying, we need your film by this date and we need, we need it here and here and, and you have to hit these benchmarks. Apparently working with a Burns uh, brother, it's just like, they basically tell the heads of PBS, go sit over there in the corner and you'll get this film when I'm ready to give it to you. And I'm like, word? That, oh, okay, so we're just, cutting and editing and he's doing this film but he's doing like four other films at the same time and then COVID happens and so I like I grab the edit system and I just bring it to my house because I knew I'm like I'm not going to want to get on the train every day and so so I got go to the edit room I set it up in my house and it's difficult for me to work in my house but but, uh, but I'm doing it and then George Floyd happens and the protests happen and then the head of PBS sorry not the head second in command of PBS calls my director and says, hey, so how about that black people film you're working on? That's kind of topical right now, right? That's, that's, that's what's popping in the streets, right? <laughs> so it's like, can we have your film tomorrow? And he's like, no, we're not finished. And we're like, okay, well, we definitely want it by October because it's a, we want it to be like an election you know, uh, sort of film because it's very popular. 
And we're like, that's great. But now our schedule, because we, we were naturally assuming, okay, they will probably uh, want it in February because, you know, it's a Black History Month, you know, Black History, you know, kind of film. And now, now all of a sudden our schedule has moved up. So before we went from this very languid, you know, nobody's really checking on us, you know, uh, we could work at our own pace. And now, now it's very intense and like every, you know, second matters, you know, sort of thing. So the, the one thing that I, uh, uh, an older editor told me one time is that you never stop editing, you just run out of time, right? There is not one single film that I've ever done that I see on TV or in a, at a film festival or on screen where I'm not still editing the film in my head, where I'm not watching the scene and going, ah, damn, I should have cut here instead of there, or I should have added five more. I take it back. There is one film. There's this film called Year of the Bull that Showtime bought. I don't think it's still available on Showtime, but it's about high school football in Florida. And every time I've ever seen that film, I sort of unexpectedly, like I'm a late night person, I'm just flipping through the channels, blah, 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 blah. I, uh, I go by Showtime and, oh, there's Year of the Bull. And, uh, and the one thing that happens with that film every time is that I stop whatever I'm doing and, you know, and whether it's in the first 15 minutes or the last 15 minutes and I watch the rest of the film and I very rarely, if ever, have said, oh, I wish I would have changed that. And I'm not saying that's a perfect film, but I, I, I'm happy with, what, with what's on screen. And generally, you know, I'm an editor and a Virgo, and I'm generally not just happy in, in general. <laughs> but uh, so you will forever be picking your films apart. But, you know, I, I, I made the uh, marriage uh, analogy uh, to Danny uh, about the relationship between uh, you and your editor. And I'd say the relationship between you and your film, whether you're the director or the editor, is like being a parent. Your parents are not happy with you, but they release you into the world, right? They're, they're still like, ooh, I wish she would have been a doctor instead of a filmmaker, but I accept him or her and I'm just gonna let them go into the world. But they're still kind of like not totally happy, you know, inside. Like I, I'm saying this and my kid is behind me somewhere. Uh, but, you, you know, like just know that you're going to have to let your baby go into the world at some point and just try to be as happy about that as you can. But you're, st you're still, I'm, I'm sorry, and not that you're not happy, but you're constantly, you're parenting your child, whether your child be 14, 24, 37, or in my case, you know, 53, it, you know, my mom is still parenting me. I, I, you're you're ne uh, never going to stop parenting your baby, but you have to uh, just let them go into the world and, and be what they want to do. So in general, I, I'd say the average editing schedule for a feature film is, you know, 10 to 15 weeks. Uh, I mean, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about reality TV, it's like, you know, the turnaround is ridiculous. If you're talking about like, you know, Game of Thrones for like an HBO, they, they tend to have a better, uh, you know, a little bit longer, you know, 20 week edit schedule per, per episode. Um, probably not 20, probably more like 12. Uh, and then for like PBS documentaries where nobody really cares about, uh, you know, you're editing for months, you know, because you're also shooting and editing, you know, at the same time, shooting, editing, running out of money. That's, that's how the phrase, the phase goes, right? You shoot, you edit, you run out of money, you raise some more money, you shoot some more, you edit some more, you run out of money. And so it's this, this, this sort of dance. But you will know, you will know when your film is done. It will announce to you the same way that a child announces to their parent, I, I'm not staying in this house anymore, right? <laughs> they, you, you, you will know, you will know. I'm out, in, uh, I'm out in Minnesota right now. And um, I was living in Minneapolis, but I moved out of that area. In light of mm. the whole George Floyd situation, I have a couple different mm. uh, publications that I write for where I'm one of the two black writers that they have. So they come running to me in the same way that you mentioned they were coming to you about um, writing that like, great hey. black movie. Right, right. How, do you, how do you prevent yourself from becoming resentful of the people who are employing you and from being angry and just... Um, being that token okay. black uh, producer, et cetera. 
Well, first of all, you don't necessarily need to lose your anger. You just have to focus it, right? There's that moment in, in, in the Avengers uh, where, where they ask um, Banner, like, you know, how do you get angry, you know, you know, all the time to bring the Hulk out? And he was like, that's the thing. I'm always angry, right? And so he said that, and I jumped up in the audience and started applauding, right? Not, not because of the Hulk. I was just like, oh, that is germane to my life, right? <laughs> that's the thing. I'm always angry. I just sort of keep it like sort of under wraps and try to focus it and control it. Yeah, you know, uh, you know I, I, I'm a runner, you know, so I, I run and uh, that's how I sort of beat, beat the anger down sometimes. But it, it, it's good to be angry. It, it's good to sort of put that into your writing, to put that into your creative process. You have to channel all that stuff. Now, do you want to be subsumed or, you know, or consumed by it? No, you, you don't want to do that, but you do want to focus it and use it and, I, I thought the question you were going to ask is, how do you avoid being pigeonholed as a black writer or as a woman writer or as a young writer? Like, because you might have interests that are far beyond that, right? So, I, I mean, honestly, the film that I really, really want to make, is, uh, sorry, I'm going to lean over to my library. So, so I'm a, I'm a huge, huge fan of Frederick Law Olmsted, who is the creator of, you know, Central Park and Prospect Park and many other parts. He's a landscape artist and, and, and a G. I mean, he, he's just, I would love to tell his story. But if I go to Ford and if I go to the other places, you know, the Rockefeller Foundation to get money, they'd be like, why, why are you telling this story? Like, you're a black man. Like, what's your relationship to the park system or to the a landscape artist and I'm like I exist I, I go to you know like uh, you know parks and stuff I, I I quite frequently no matter what part of the country am I uh, that I'm in I find, I find out that if Olmsted designed a park there and I go uh, and look at it and admire it and say so I'm perfectly um, qualified to tell the story but they don't see me in that right but they'll be the first person to call me for a black story I also am a black person. I love telling black people's stories. I, I, I quite often, especially when I'm working for white filmmakers, they ask me, uh, you know, uh, during the interview process, and I'm like, well, when we talk about money, just know that there's what you're paying me, but I'm also paid a stipend uh, by Brother Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam to make white people look bad uh, in movies. So just know that I, I, my, my sort of, my, my funds are sort of allocated in that way. And they're like, what? Are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I, I'm just joking. I mean, I wish that Farrakhan would pay me that. But, you know, I, I, I try to uh, sort of address the elephant in the room, which is, you know, race. So it's like, I, I know that I'm here to be the Black voice in the room. You know, there is a huge debate going on on social media right now. There is a, a Tiger Woods documentary being made. And it's being made by two white filmmakers and being made by this company, Jigsaw, uh, which my friend Alex Gibney is the, is the owner of. Um, and they get a lot of work and they do a lot of stuff and they get really, really big budgets. And maybe people are a little resentful of that because they get to tell all the stories, you know. You know. Um, but it came out on social media that some other friends of mine, uh, the great, great uh, editor and director, Gita Ganbir, uh, said, you know, did you interview any Black filmmakers to maybe co-tell this story with you? I mean, Tiger is black and Asian and he's like everything and then he used to refer to himself as Kablaklan Asian or whatever. So did you interview any other people to be a part of this story? And they were like, no. And then it sort of became a big thing and they were sort of in the middle of quote unquote, you know, being canceled. Uh, and it became this big thing. And I, I was very concerned with that. I was very concerned with uh, the fact that they, they didn't even consider any uh, non-white voices to help tell this story. but. Concerned the side of that surprised. one for me was that like, I, I occasionally want to tell stories that aren't black stories and I don't want anybody to tell me I can't tell that story because I'm not, you know, you know, I don't think that you have to be, look exactly like the person in order to tell the story, but I do think that diverse voices bring, bring diverse perspectives to the storytelling, you know, scenario. And so I'm always, you know, uh, uh, in, in favor of that, but Anyway, it's a tricky game. And so I would say fight for as much edit time as you possibly can get because you're going to need it. You're, you're, you're going to need it. So. Thank you, Amir. I think, yeah. you know, that, that again, that's 
that's even a more perfect note to end on. I mean, especially, you know, talking about diversity, um, essentially, you know, diverse voices is what makes a good film a good film as well, right? So we want diversity um, as far as the auteurs, but then we want diversity in the edit room. You want different voices. And then you have yeah. the editor who is, again, driving that yacht, taking in all the information and steering the course in the best way. So, you know, we really are so grateful for you, you know, staying over, answering everyone's questions. If everyone could just come off mute and just do a little applause. <laughs> that would be dope. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So this, is, this is great. This is great. <laughs> when you go one more time to officially close out, um, housekeeping you know thank you for joining ghetto film school's film credits masterclass editing with amir lewis film credits is a virtual learning mini platform for the couple of film challenge presented by ghetto film school agency and warner media um learn more about the short film challenge on filmcredits.org i hope to see everyone's entries and you know i wish everyone a very very wonderful close out of the summer please take care and stay safe all right, y'all.